He was born in Provo, Utah, spent some time, 18 months, Utah National Guard, Ohio State University, Naval War College. He uh, was assigned a number of command battalions. He flew 188 combat missions in Vietnam. After the war, 74, and middle war, 74, he assigned to headquarters U.S. Air Force, Washington, D.C. as Chief Joint Plans and Policy Branch. He was then assigned as, as Assistant Deputy Chief of Staff for Manpower and Personnel. He became Commander of the Allied Air Forces, Southern Europe, and Deputy Commander-in-Chief, U.S. Air Forces in Europe for the Southern Area, headquartered in Naples. October 86, he became Commander of the Air Training Command with headquarters at Randolph Air Base, Texas. He assumed his present position in June of 1990, and that position is Commander-in-Chief. U.S. Air Forces in Europe, Commander, Allied Air Forces, Central Europe. What that doesn't say is what may be the central fact. He is a command pilot with more than 4,000 flying hours, including over 300 combat hours. He's going to speak on Bosnia, air power, and NATO. General Robert C. Oaks. Well, we would have all been better off if I had introduced Brad and he had talked. Uh, it would have been more exciting and more interesting, but I, uh, uh, he didn't volunteer to do that. I appreciate the chance to be here with you tonight in Baltimore. I have uh, driven up to Baltimore from Washington many times in my life in Washington to watch ball games and to bring my children up to your uh, 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 aquarium and the other sites here. And uh, although I can't call it home, I certainly feel at home tonight. So thank you for uh, letting me come join you tonight, and I hope that I can uh, uh, give you some thoughts, uh, stimulate some thoughts on your part that are uh, worth your evening. It's a, uh, it is a great pleasure to be here. Now, I appreciate the opportunity to talk tonight uh, about, uh, share with you my thoughts on European security and on NATO. Now, I uh, do not plan to say a lot about Bosnia. I'll tell you just a little bit. I'll respond in, in, our quest in uh, the question period uh, to whatever you want to ask about Bosnia. We have uh, many troops that are involved in it, and we've done some exciting things. Uh, so I'll be happy to discuss it during questions and answer period. Um, but I think it's important. The thing that I think is most useful is that we have a chance tonight to talk about Europe. I've been there for three years this tour. I was there for uh, two years in Naples and then for four years uh, in a previous tour in uh, Germany. So I feel comfortable at least aware of the issues that, uh, that face Europe and that face us. And there are no singular European questions. They are our questions and our issues and our problems and our opportunities. And so I'll be happy to, to talk about them. Now, uh, this is a, an appropriate time to talk about Europe, to talk about NATO in great turmoil in Central Europe and, uh, and Eastern Europe, and some in Western Europe. And, uh, and NATO has not escaped that turmoil. During my three years as Commander-in-Chief of the United States Air Forces in Europe, I have witnessed many questions coming from both sides of the Atlantic about U.S. involvement and positions and uh, uh, stations in Europe, questions about uh, the need for NATO, questions on how many U.S. troops there should be in Europe, and, uh, or if there should be any troops at all. Question on what are, what are NATO's appropriate future roles. Now, although this questioning has gone on, and it goes on, I sense that there is a, a new understanding, a better understanding, emerging within our country and within the world regarding what is the real threat to European and to international security. Interestingly uh, enough, two years ago, we couldn't even use the word threat in NATO circles. Uh, literally prohibited to talk about threat because everyone said the threat has gone away and you will create a threat if you talk about the threat. Now, nobody's saying that today. People realize that the threat has changed dramatically but not disappeared. And I'll talk a little bit about the threat perceived today, my view of the threat, and. Uh, 
uh, and how we need to look uh, toward that threat in the future. In the past, the threat was always very clear in its source, in its magnitude, and in its direction. In that bipolar world that we lived in, analyzing the threat, quantifying the threat in terms of uh, tanks, in terms of aircraft, in terms of artillery pieces, in terms of men under arms, was a very easy thing to do. We could count it all. It was, uh, we got very good at counting, and this was an easy kind of threat analysis to do. But the demise of the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact has made this kind of threat assessment and analysis obsolete. Now, instability and uncertainty themselves have become the threat. This new threat is much more difficult to quantify and to counter. How many army divisions do you need to combat instability? How many aircraft are required to defend against uncertainty? And equally difficult to forecast is where will instability and uncertainty erupt into conflict next? All over Eastern Europe, the promise of freedom and the promise of democracy has fanned the flames of century-old ethnic, political, and religious rivalries. Nowhere is this condition more evident than in the former Yugoslavia. And it's interesting to look at that for a minute. The roots of that conflict go back to, back to at least the ninth century when the split occurred between the Eastern Orthodox Serbs and the Roman Catholic Croatians. And then in the 14th century, the Turkish Ottoman Empire dominated the area and brought in the Muslim religion into the equation. And since that time, this area has been a flashpoint for conflict in Europe, as, as any historian knows. Now, the, this violence and ethnic discord and religious rivalry that we witness there today, they're not new developments. They are rather a continuation of over a thousand years of conflict in this volatile region. Former Yugoslavia, of course, is not alone in these headlines of conflict and turmoil. Similar conflicts are smoldering or raging in the republics of the former Soviet Union, from the Baltics and Moldova to the west, west to Tajikistan and into Central Asia. In the Transcaucasus, for example, Georgian forces right now are at war with the separatists in the western part of the country, and that's in the news regularly, in all the intelligence summaries. Just to the south of Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan have been engaged in a long and bitter dispute and a war. Here the potential for spillover into Turkey is significant and worrisome. Now further east into Tajikistan, it can, that <coughs> conflict continues to simmer in a civil war that is pitting the Islamic rebels against the pro-government forces. And there a fanatic is Islamic resurgence could uh, easily spread into all of the surrounding countries, most of which have a dominant Islamic religion. And of course, most ominous of all when we talk about threats are the events in Russia itself. We all watched in amazement just last week and in the last couple of weeks, the showdown between President Yeltsin and his, the Russian parliament, and as that came to a climax. Now, just a few months ago, two months ago, who would have predicted or guessed that Russian tanks would be firing at their White House? And yet we all saw that on TV. Now, we're comforted by the current outcome, but who would dare guess what will be the outcome of the next chapter in this saga? And, uh, and it really, when we talk about one heartbeat away, uh, the heartbeat of, of President Yeltsin is a, is a heartbeat that should scare you because nobody knows what, what stands behind him, what would be the follow-on. So if there's any life on earth that we should pray for every night, I think it's that of President Yeltsin. Uh, we could probably talk about that, but when you think it through, uh, there is really stability hanging on one man's life. Now, there are still along that line, there are still considerable numbers of arch conservatives in Russia, and read that communists, uh, throughout Russia who might attempt, they said they would attempt, those in parliament, to turn back the clock and uh, destroy the political progress and economic reforms. They have been slight, but they have been in the right direction, those reforms of the last couple of years in Russia. And there are people eager 
to lay that to waste and turn back the clock. The success of the parliamentary election that is slated for December will be a major milestone, uh, certainly in determining the future of uh, course of events uh, for President Yeltsin, for Russia as a whole, and really for the entire world. So we will watch that very carefully and uh, with great anticipation. Now, as ev these events unfold in Russia, uh, we, there's grave concern, there should be, there is, over the control and the disposition of the nuclear arsenal of the former Soviet Union. And though the threat of the full-scale nuclear confrontation is dramatically lessened uh, in the past three years, and it's been lessened by historic arms agreement as well as the dismantling of the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact, we ki still can't forget that there are significant n nuclear stockpiles uh, there, and we have to worry about their destruction and their control. Um, that same instability that we have just been talking about uh, it, and, and the, can affect further arms reduction and can affect the disposition of those nuclear weapons. And uh, wor it worries us that these nuclear technologies could proliferate to uh, potential adversaries. And when you think about it, and of course there have been novels written about it and they have stirred up our imagination, but they're not far from reality or far from uh, a possibility. What small terrorist group would not love to have the blackmail powers available that go along with the possession of a nuclear weapon? And of course that is frightening. Now, any discussion of the threat uh, has to include the situation in Iraq. And it's an amazing thing, but despite the overwhelming victory of the coalition forces in Desert Storm, Iraq continues to threaten the peace and stability in the Middle East. And the coalition forces are still required today to enforce compliance with United Nations resolutions. And there's no end in sight. The, it seems clear that, the for, that force or the threat of force will be required in Iraq for some time to come. And we tend to forget it, I don't forget it, but I don't see it in the newspapers a lot, but every day we have our forces from United States Air Forces in Europe flying combat missions over northern Iraq to make sure that Saddam Hussein does not take uh, untoward military action, aggressive action against the Kurds, drive them back into the mountains and, uh, and put them back in the news like we saw them two winters ago. Uh, so that, that pressure that inclination on his part, there's no indication that it has changed. Now, whether we are doing this to cure Saddam Hussein's uh, ambitions regarding his neighbors or to protect the Kurds, it doesn't matter that we still need that force capability, that threat of force, to keep him in line. In recent years, we have witnessed refugees from areas of turmoil like northern Iraq, like the Kurds, and those people have become an additional threat Refugees today are a major part of the threat when we, when we talk about it. And they have moved around, they, they create great instability, and, as, and it is destabilizing to governments in Europe the prospect of waves of displaced persons crossing borders to seek safety. In 1992, for example, over a million refugees crossed into Germany alone. Refugees coming from the former Soviet Union, former Yugoslavia, and other lands under stress. Well, that is a threat to a government, and we have seen, and, and I think, that may, most of what you've seen on the news, adverse uh, publicity regarding Germany and the neo-Nazi uh, uh, movement is in response to the uh, threat of refugees moving in. It is not a political uh, movement, it is an anti-refugee movement. And that same potential and that same pressure exists in uh, many other countries in Europe, and we even see some of it in our country. For Germany and for Hungary and for Turkey and Greece and Albania and Bulgaria and others, the refugee problem, they see it as a real threat. And that threat continues as we talk about threat down into Africa where there's instability and you read this in the newspaper every day, I promise you, in Angola and Togo and Zaire and Sudan and Mozambique and obviously Somalia. And Somalia is a good case in point of what can happen when what seems like a simple humanitarian mission is embarked on and it can uh, turn into much more than that, as, as we well know. Final note on threats, as we talk about it today, we can't overlook the threat of Muslim fanaticism. 
And that's the right word. It's not Muslim fundamentalism. Muslim fundamentalism is a responsible government or a responsible religion, and you will offend Muslims if you talk about Muslim fundamentalism, uh, just like you will, you will uh, offend Southern Baptists if you talk about them in that kind of tone, because it is a, a responsible branch. Fanaticism is what is irresponsible, and fanatical Muslim religion is what frightens all the people in Europe and all the governments of the Middle East and the governments of Africa. And, uh, and they see it as a threat. And I've walked into many senior government offices, both military and civilian, and the first thing they want to talk about is Muslim fanaticism and what to do about it. And uh, so that thread is woven into the, to the tapestry of, of Africa, of Europe, and of course of the Middle East. And it, uh, it not only increases the potential of conflict, but it also increases the likelihood that the conflicts will spread from one government or from one country to the other, uh, from one region to another, like a, a forest fire jumping a fire break because it has a particular chemistry and a particular dynamics about it that lets it do that. So despite the fall of the Berlin Wall, despite the dissolution, uh, the dissolution of the Warsaw Pact and the unraveling of the former Soviet Union, it's uh, abundantly clear to me, and I hope to you, that the threat has not gone away. We can, as responsible people, talk about threat. Uh, it has not gone away, but it has changed. Now, in the face of this uncertainty and this turmoil and this threat, we need a stable and a proven security structure. Now, fortunately, one already exists, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO. And it's based on tried and true principles of alliance security, and alliance security among nations with a common set of values, values based on human dignity, democracy, free economy, and the other things that we know as the basis of our uh, government and our approach to relations with other governments. Now, as early as November 1991, the leaders of NATO member nations met in Rome and they uh, wanted to start off and inaugurate a new chapter in Alliance history. And they stated uh, that the Alliance will continue to play a key role in building a new and lasting order of peace in Europe. Now that sounds uh, dramatic and maybe kind of pithy even. But in fact, the subsequent events have been built on that concept and built on the, the flesh that was added to that skeleton and there's been dramatic change in NATO. Uh, when I used to work in the NATO division in the, bill, in the Pentagon, uh, and I was responsible for uh, air staff re uh, relations with NATO, why, we always felt it moved slowly. In fact, NATO stood for no action, talk only among the action officers. <laughs> and uh, so I were viewed with some intrepidation as we moved into this new security uh, situation, how would NATO respond? And I'll tell you, it's been amazing to me, as someone that's been working with NATO for a long time, to see how rapidly and how appropriately the Alliance has responded to the new situation. Now, those folks, when they gathered in Rome in 91, their collective judgment was that the Alliance had been and will remain the cornerstone for security in Europe and for much of the rest of the world. Now, their judgment was profound. And I believe that NATO today is as important to both European and American interests as at any time in its history. And I'll try and talk you through that. NATO today remains as the bulwark of collective security for Western democracies. And under NATO auspices, the nations of Western Europe have developed and formed habits of cooperation and friendship that have taken the place of historic animosities and distrust. And you just don't have to be very knowledgeable about European history to reflect back and realize that these past 45 years have been an amazing 45 years, a 45 years of peace and cooperation, and that all came about because of the alliance. The alliance first was formed and held Western Europe together, and second it was formed with military capability that rejected the Soviet Union and their uh, potential and stated uh, aggressive uh, desires and aggressive aims with respect to Western Europe. Now, NATO is also, and I think this doesn't always get uh, appreciated fully, it's a, a useful instrument in fostering democratic de development 
in the fragile governments in Eastern Europe. And in fact, Eastern Europeans see themselves, the nations see NATO as their only hope, and their, certainly their best hope, for long-term security. In my travels to Eastern Europe and Russia, and even into Africa, the story I hear is always the same. NATO, and a strong U.S. role in NATO, is the key to a stable and secure Europe and even beyond. We had an opportunity to go to Russia and we sat in a seminar with uh, uh, 13 retired and active duty Russian general officers, both air and army. And uh, uh, we talked about a lot of things for a while and finally one of them said, uh, he, he said he could envision the day when NATO would be responsible for the security of the northern hemisphere from Vladivostok to Vancouver. And he wasn't talking about across the Bering Straits. And none of those guys argued with him. You know, some, one guy said, well, I'm not sure I'd go quite that far. But the other said, that's a good thought, that, it would, that NATO has that potential. Now, that's amazing. These are the Russians. These are the folks that right after the Warsaw Pact went away, they said, now NATO's got away. And about two weeks later, they came back and said, wait a minute, maybe you ought to keep NATO. And they took the pressure off. And they, they saw NATO as the stabilizing force in a Europe without the Warsaw Pact. Now, at that time, they didn't envision it without a Soviet Union. But they still say no negative words about NATO. Instead, they receive our NATO uh, emissaries, our military-to-military -military contacts that go there. They ask us for things, and things, not things in airplanes, ships, and tanks. They want to know how to do it. How do you run a democracy? How do you have a military under a civilian democratic control? And uh, they want to know the things we want to teach them. Uh, and, and it's a great teaching opportunity. And they're very frank in telling you the things that they need. They understand their shortfalls. They understand their shortcomings. And this is not just the Russians. This is the Western Europe, uh, the Eastern Europeans. Uh, we, are, we are sending people there, they said, Send, and we have sent lawyers. And that's frightening. But we have done it. But we have done it. With a, and we have sent lawyers over there, military lawyers, to help them understand, in fact, how you create a responsible be legal basis for discipline in a military. Theirs has been arbitrary and capricious by their own admission. And they want to set up a uniform code of military justice kind of thing that lets that lets the soldier and the sailor and the airman understand their rights and their responsibilities for discipline and for behavior in a military organization. Dramatic change from the way they've done th things in the past. And we're eager to share that kind of knowledge. They want to set up an NCO academy. They come to America. They come see our NCOs. They see the responsibility that we give them, how well they discharge that responsibility, and they, they are hungry for it. A uh, great story about, let's see, in 1988, I think, 89, uh, maybe, uh, uh, General Akromayov, who was the chairman of the, uh, the senior Russian military leader, and Admiral Krau, who was our chairman of our Joint Chiefs of Staff, brought a delegation of Russians to America, and they traveled all around. And as they were out briefing, as they were stopped back when talked with the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the chairman, they said, we knew your equipment would be good. We've got, we knew all about that. We knew your bases would be good. He said, but we had no idea how good your people would be. And, uh, and they were focused on enlisted people. In fact, they accused us that we had taken officers and dressed them up in NCO uniforms. <laughs> the NCOs were insulted at that, incidentally. <laughs> but uh, but they, were, they were just really impressed. In fact, I think it's a major step in letting them understand the quality of the force that they were facing, and a major step in letting them realize they were not going to prevail in a military uh, way against uh, uh, the forces of NATO and the Western world. And uh, so they want those same kind of forces. They want NCOs like we have NCOs. And uh, in fact, we're helping some of them set up NCO academies to make their military more responsible and, uh, and more effective in a in an administrative way. Well, a uh, major reason for NATO's value and uh, is, I think, is its ability to change and adapt to this new situation that we have talked about. 
And as I said earlier, I didn't expect that it would happen that fast and that effectively. But we are changing within the Alliance, under, currently undergoing sweeping changes that take into account this new threat that we have discussed and the changing strategic situation and the changing fiscal situation within the member governments. The old strategy of static defense along the eastern boundary of NATO region, that's no longer appropriate and it has been abandoned. And in its place, NATO forces are reorganizing and they're reorganizing into multinational organizations, contingency forces, emphasizing speed, mobility, flexibility, and they're going to be smaller and they're going to rely much less on nuclear weapons. Uh, that was a major part of our strategy in the past. It's been dramatically de-emphasized and reduced. NATO forces are now preparing to go where the fight is and uh, be prepared to uh, engage in a flexible way uh, in that fight. For the first time, NATO is looking beyond its borders to outward contingencies and beyond the traditional area of responsibility. That's a dramatic change. You used to, in a NATO meeting, could not talk about, could not talk about out of area operations. And now every meeting discusses out of area operations. Of course, the best example of this is in the current conflict in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And here are the results of NATO's many years of living and working and exercising together are producing what we call, have produced what we call interoperability. And uh, that interoperability is ongoing in uh, Bosnia today. Now, interoperability means we work together. And the value of it was best demonstrated in the Gulf War. The air war in the Gulf War was fought using NATO procedures, procedures that let all of those air forces fly together off of one daily tasking order. And we refueled together, and we bombed together, and we recovered together in a very closely integrated way. And that was because of the interoperability that had been developed within the Alliance over the years of working together. Pays dig big dividends for us today in our current operations in Bosnia-Herzegovina. The tactics, the command and control procedures, the uh, operating bases, and the logistical support arrangements uh, we, in those areas, we have benefited from that exercising and working together and the collective defense and uh, mutual security over the years. Aircraft, American aircraft, U.S. aircraft have been joined by our German and our French partners in the humanitarian airdrop. You've seen those on TV and uh, read about them in the newspaper. A great success story, and it shows that close working together. I'll tell you, and uh, it... Uh, when they first told us, first told me, they said, you're going to drop food bundles from 10,000 feet with parachutes at night in the weather. I said, you can't do that. Now, I'm not an experienced airlift, so I called my airlifters and I said, how about this? And they said, you can't do that. And, uh, but we, we were issued that, that order. So we said, okay, we'll try it. And we went out and we practiced. And now, when you push something out from 10,000 feet in a parachute, the wind affects it and you don't know exactly where it's going to hit. We didn't think. We'd never tried it. And so our guys went down to Graf and Revere Range, and they started pushing these bundles out the back. And they said, hmm, they go where you think they'll go. And we, uh, they, they are more predictable than we thought. We can get better winds than we thought we could. And uh, so we started doing that. And then they said, uh, uh, by the way, the French and the Germans are going to fly with you. Well, they don't have the right kind of equipment uh, to keep exact position and we're dropping with a radar picture off of that front airplane just like you would drop a radar bomb. And so the guy's got a crosshair uh, that he aims over a junction in the river or a building and he puts and then puts in an offset and we can do it exactly. But they didn't have that capability. And we said, uh, we can't. And then they said, the Russians might come join you. And we said, we can't do that. And my guys up there in the, at Rhine Mine, the airlifter said, just a minute, sir, let us come down. And they came down and they said, so we've got the little handheld global positioning system, fish, uh, not fish finder, but that the hunters take out into the woods to find themselves. Cost, I think, $800, well-heeled hunters. And they, said, uh, and they said, we can do, take this in the air, and when we get the signal to drop, we'll punch that uh, little GPS uh, fisherman's friend, and uh, it'll freeze the coordinates where we drop from, and then we'll transmit it back, and they'll punch them into theirs and they'll get instructions to fly right to it, and it works. 
and it works. And it's an amazing story of interoperability and working together and cooperative attitude. And we were ready for the Russians. They didn't show up. They wanted us to pay the bill and we declined. But they didn't show up, but we were ready for them because of that experience that we have had over the years within the alliance of working together. Uh, our guys are pretty cocky right now. They think that there isn't anything they can't do, and, and we like them to think that way. But it's a great success story. The, um, the, in the, down in Bosnia, Herzegovina, uh, we have, we're conducting Operation Deny Flight, as you know. And there the uh, Dutch and the French and the Turkish, as well as American fighters, uh, Air Force and Navy, are engaged in enforcing the UN no-fly zone, uh, the resolution, over Bosnia. And that's been another great cooperative effort based on alliance membership and alliance experience. The multinational NATO airborne warning, warning and uh, control aircraft, it plays an indispensable role. And those aircraft, and they're located over there, they have on, on the crew, they'll have Turks and they'll have Greeks and they'll have uh, Italians and they'll have Brits and they'll have uh, Americans all on the same crew controlling the flight. And it's working beautifully. And, uh, and, and uh, a great, another great story about NATO alliance cooperation and effective cooperation. Ground forces from the United Kingdom and uh, several other nations have also placed themselves in harm's way as they, as they have put uh, thousands of forces on the ground in Bosnia-Herzegovina to uh, enforce the, play, the, the peace, and, and especially in, uh, in Croatia. Uh, we are now looking to, uh, if there is a signed peace agreement, uh, Van Owen Stoltenberg uh, peace agreement, uh, why then we're ready to help enforce that with uh, close air support sorties. And we have trained with the people on the ground so that we're ready to give them air protection if, they're, uh, if hostilities break out on the ground in that next step of the process, of the peace process in Bosnia. Well, whatever na role that NATO plays in, in Bosnia, it's, uh, inter it's certain that it will be in conjunction with the United Nations. Now, I talked about adapting to the new situation, and that's one that's kind of slipped in, but it's a dramatic change. Now, today, NATO is the United Nations military executor in uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina. We are their military arm, and everybody likes it. Everybody's comfortable with that, and we're prepared to act in conjunction, uh, NATO and the United Nations together, to uh, help bring about and foster the peace process if we can get an, a, an agreed to document. And that's a great change and it shows that flexibility that I've discussed about the alliance. Um, well, as we look forward to the future, now I'd like to talk and offer what I, what I guess you would term as an American perspective, but it's also a perspective about, uh, or a perspective that is accepted and I think agreed to uh, by all of the European nations. Um, and the, and it, the, that perspective goes along this line, that the U.S has an indispensable role in the NATO alliance, and it is the underpinning of the alliance's strength, and it provides a global rather than a regional perspective to the alliance. And with advanced technology and with a complete spectrum of weapon system, we provide NATO with critical military capability that's not available elsewhere, specifically air refueling, strategic airlift, electronic combat, precision guided munitions. And, uh, and those are all necessary for mo modern warfare. Uh, but, and so we provide those military capabilities. That's important. But we also play and provide the critical leadership role that isn't as well understood. And that has helped foster that cohesion and that solidarity and that interoperability that I talked about before. Our active participation has been the cornerstone of the Atlantic Bridge, which is so vital to the concept of collective dis defense within the Alliance. President Eisenhower said it several years ago, and it's still true. The U.S. is the glue that holds NATO together. Now, that sounds good, and the media say, yeah, but what's our, why are we doing that? What's our obligation? It's costing us money. And that's an interesting and a useful comment, but it's important to understand, and if there's a single point that I can make tonight, and have you remember when you walk out, it's that the, is that the NATO alliance is in the best interest of the United States. Our own security and economic well-being are, un, are um, undeniably linked to a safe, secure, and stable Europe. And we've proven this twice in this century. 
I shouldn't have to discuss that very long because why did we go over there in 1915? Why did we go back in 1940, 1942? Because we have vital national interests. We went back in 1948. Most people don't think of it that way, but we abandoned Europe in 1918, left them to their own devices. We abandoned them in 1945, left them to their own devices. And the Berlin Wall, I'm sorry, the Berlin blockade and the uh, subsequent uh, airlift, Berlin airlift, brought us back in. We, have, we were down to 50 U.S. Air Force airplanes. At that time, they were Army Air Corps airplanes in 1947. We had gotten out. We had again left Europe to its own devices. Uh, they need us. They will be the first to tell you they need us. They need our leadership. And they need our participation. And we care. We have vital interests there. Europe, until I think just the last six months, has been the one area of the world where we had a positive balance of payments with respect to trade. Uh, we have a lot of vital interests. Most of us in this room have some ethnic or cultural link or uh, historical link, family link with Europe. And, uh, and we have proven that twice, three times over this century. And uh, so I don't think we have to, we shouldn't have to argue that we are vitally linked to Europe. So why would we want to win the Cold War and then walk away from it one more time? Uh, it doesn't make any sense. The, um, well, I hope we won't make that same mistake again. I hope that we understand the importance of staying engaged in a leadership way in NATO. And it's only by staying engaged that the U.S. will continue to receive the benefits of access, of efficiency, and of influence that the NATO alliance offers us. Now, let me just talk about those for a minute. As a member of NATO, the U.S. maintains access to European facilities that allow us to execute our current operations, the Bosnian operation, to provide comfort down in Italy that we talked about where we're protecting the Kurds, flying combat missions over Iraq every day, out of a NATO alliance uh, airfield there in, in Incirlik, Turkey. We fly over Iraq out of bases in, in Turkey. We deliver food to Bosnia, both airdrop and land, landing at Sarajevo uh, from bases in Germany. We supported Desert Storm and we supported Somalian throughput through bases in Spain, in Germany, in the UK, and Turkey, and Greece, and Italy, and the other NATO nations. And we couldn't have gotten there to either one of those conflicts without that support. Today's deny flight, as I said, was our, those missions and, uh, and any close air support missions of the future will be flown out of bases in Italy. Now this access that we enjoy allows us to be effective, but the Alliance also offers us, uh, increases our efficiency. Each NATO member shares in the security and deterrence generated by the combined military force of all the member states. From the perspective of the UK and Germany or Italy, why US forces have been operating in their behalf for the last four decades. But likewise, these same countries have been operating on behalf of America all these years as we stood shoulder to shoulder against that threat that, uh, against our shared values. And we don't normally think of the alliance that way. It's very efficient to share the responsibility, to share the burden, to share the cost. Now finally, an active involvement in NATO provides the U.S. an opportunity to influence events in Europe. And our interest in that safe and secure Europe must not be left to chance, as we earlier said. And as the leader, as a major leader in the alliance, the U.S. participates in shaping events in Europe. It'd be a mistake for us to forfeit this role in an attempt to isolate and insulate ourselves from the realities of a world in turmoil. Isolationism has proven counterproductive in the past, and it holds no promise for the future. We are reducing dramatically, and I don't want it to sound like I'm arguing for the status quo. We're reducing dramatically U.S. presence in Europe, and it will continue to get smaller. We started out with 320,000 troops in Europe uh, in 1988, and we will reduce down to 100,000. So we're going to cut out over two-thirds of our forces in Europe. And the Air Force portion of this is equally dramatic. We started out with 84,000 of those 320,000. We're going down to about 34,000. We had 34 major bases in Europe, and we're going down to less than 10, probably like six or seven. Uh, we had 30 fighter squadrons. We're going down to less than 10 fighter squadrons. 
uh, dramatic reductions. But even with this drawdown and that significant, uh, we will maintain a significant capability. We will keep our modern aircraft there, our F-15s, our F-16s. The Navy will forward deploy carriers. And uh, so we will have a, an effective combat force. We'll maintain a reinforcement profile so that we can bring troops and forces uh, and equipment back to Europe should the need arise or so that we can throughput them. Uh, so despite those smaller numbers, NATO is going to maintain a structure, a command and control structure, and a force structure that I think will be responsive to the challenges that, uh, that we foresee in that world of turmoil. Our world is safer than it was five years ago, but it's not yet secure. The new threats of instability and uncertainty will demand that a credible military capability remains and to secure and maintain the peace. NATO is adapting to that new security environment in both strategy and force structure. The U.S. has a vital role to play in shaping and supporting the NATO of the future. I appreciate the chance to come and share these thoughts with you. I look forward to your questions. I think the question, and you certainly can interpret as you see best, I think the question is uh, um, just uh, how uh, stable can democracy be in a relatively unstable world, or in short, um, can you connect uh, a concept of stability to the future of democracy? Is that a fair reinterpretation? Well, let, let me, you said, how would I define stability in this time of insta uh, instability that we've discussed today? And, uh, and I would define it first, what are, the, what are the things we care about? Stability is, I don't have a continuing threat on my borders of someone wanting to invade me. I don't have within my borders, I don't have a continuing threat or ongoing war. Uh, war made up of uh, uh, ethnic war, religious war, uh, or political war, civil war. Uh, so the absence of war and the threat of war, and, and that sounds kind of uh, maybe sophomoric, but in fact that's the threat that the Poles and the Hungarians and the, Czech, the Czechs and the Slovaks and the other people of uh, Central Europe they look at their history, and that's what they're primarily concerned with. I traveled to Poland uh, a couple of months ago. I did six or seven uh, interviews on TV and radio. Every one of them, their first word is, when can we get in NATO? They want that security. They want a mutual security pact uh, like they have seen in NATO so effective. So there, to them, they would define stability as a freedom from an anticipation of another round of invasion from somewhere. Uh, also, you look at it as economics. Uh, the stability is certainly uh, has an economic face, and that is the ability for an economy to grow and for all of the citizens of a nation to have some prospect of being able to work and get paid for their work and to have uh, uh, some uh, respect for property that is a foundation for a stable economic system and uh, that kind of opportunity. I, access to world markets, I think you would have to put in a stability definition. Political stability, uh, obviously a democratic process is how I would define it. And I think that's a reasonable definition uh, because every place we have not had a reasonable democratic process, there is instability. You end up with war. So I think in terms, uh, in, uh, that's how I would define stability. And that's, I'm confident, how uh, our Polish friends, if they were standing here, our Hungarian friends, they would define it in those same ways because they look to their history and that's what they've been missing. Yes, sir. Do you foresee additional members in NATO and if so, who and under what conditions? Um, great question. I won't tell you who because uh, it would be a limited list because I'd run out and somebody would feel hurt. Uh, it, I like my Russian friend's uh, definition of NATO. Uh, NATO responsible, we might not call it NATO, but uh, son of NATO responsible for security and stability from Vladivostok to Vancouver. Now that get, takes in quite a list of countries. Uh, but I think it, one of the great challenges that faces NATO today is how we spread the concept of deterrence, the concept of stability, the concept of mutual security, the efficiency of it and the effectiveness of it uh, beyond the NATO boundary today so that other nations can enjoy that same kind of confidence that they have a friend and a series of friends that will protect them and, and give them this, this kind of security we've been talking about. Now, uh, so we're going to have to look beyond it. And I think everybody's talking about looking beyond it. Uh, 
Now the how is the, you know, the devil's in the detail. Uh, and I like to go back to um, what is NATO, and it's a mutually beneficial organization to all members. It is not a charity organization, and people have joined out of their own self-interest, and they have stayed in because of their own self-interest. So everybody, the member nations, have to feel that they get something out of this expanded population if that happens. And so nations have to be able to bring something to the table. It isn't just a we're going to give you a security ticket. It's they have to bring something to the table. So what do they bring? Well, first you would expect them to bring a democratic and a human rights kind of atmosphere within their country because that's been, we talk about the shared values that are a foundation for the effectiveness of NATO. So those shared values have to be present when you look out and talk about new members. There, have to, there has to be a military effectiveness, I think, when you talk. They have to bring some military capability so that as you bring in a member, it's not all liability. They bring in a military capability. And, uh, uh, but I wouldn't want to make the list too long. Those are things that are achievable. And because uh, you don't want it to be a prohibitive list of accomplishments that have to come about. Uh, you want to expand that concept, uh, that, that mutual security concept, as, as fast as you can, but you don't want to extend it irresponsibly and suddenly take on more security responsibilities than you're prepared to handle. And if you took in too many, you'd say, the people would say, hey, wait, NATO can't reach out and touch uh, those people's enemies, so it would lose its military credibility. It's a very tough question. There is no easy answer. The only thing that I think is easy about it is NATO has to look to grow. And uh, words that are being used, Secretary General uh, Werner is using words like associate membership. And, uh, and, that, and we know how associate memberships work in all sorts of organizations. And so that's a useful way to start thinking about it. But, I'll, uh, but the devil's in the detail, and I'll let the politicians that are meeting in NATO, I think, this week uh, talk about those details. And they'll be talking about it, because there's great pressure from Eastern Europe to do it. Yes, sir. Two questions. The present relationship of France to NATO and uh, plans to prevent Serbian aggression in Bosnia. First, uh, France is in the NATO alliance but not in the military uh, organization. Uh, they have liaison offices with all of the liaison officers with all of the military headquarters. I have a French uh, uh, general that is uh, in my air sent headquarters at Ramstein and, and uh, all of the other headquarters do. So they, there's a liaison function there, but they are in the, in, they are not in the integrated military staff, but they are in the political, the, the North Atlantic Council portion of the alliance. Uh, so they, they have political discussions, they don't have military discussions, uh, I guess is the best way to sum it up. The, now, regarding air power in Bosnia-Herzegovina, uh, there, are, there are a lot of things we can do, and, uh, and those have been discussed in the press and at all uh, the high councils. People want easy ways to stop Serbian aggression against the Muslims, especially around Sarajevo. Uh, we have said in the Air Force, we can do some of that. Don't expect us to do it all because we can't because you're talking about very difficult to find targets. Artillery pieces can be moved around and if you took out all the artillery pieces, mortars can really be moved around and they're hard to find. And air power, we can destroy pinpoint targets. We can put bombs through a particular window and almost a pane of glass in a particular window. But you've got to see the window. And windows are stable. Some of these targets aren't stable, so finding the target is tough. If we can find the targets, and we can find artillery pieces, not all of them, but we can do uh, some credible things, and we can do some important things. But I don't like to talk about air power in a vacuum. Uh, since World War II, in every instance where we've employed military uh, uh, might, military force, it has been a team operation, and, uh, and our U.S. military today is a team operation. The Goldwater Nichols Bill of, what, 87, I think, uh, was a uh, uh, underscored, underwrote, and improved our team concept with Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine uh, forces operating together. Uh, so air power uh, can't do it alone. We can do a lot of great things, and we like to document them and talk about them, but uh, we operate as a team. And uh, so we can do some things, we can slow them down, but I, I would not ever say that air power can stop the Serbs from aggressing on the Muslims. Um.
Okay. Yes, sir. You had a NATO of, of a cooperative uh, command structure. There's some national discontent with the idea of American forces being under the command of another nation. Uh, can you comment on that from your experience at NATO? Well, I'm a, I, I frankly have been a little bit surprised by the uh, raising of the question because for the last, uh, since 1948, we have had U.S. troops uh, under, under commanders, NATO commanders of other nations. I work for a German four-star. I've got three bosses. One is the Chief of Staff, United States Air Force, and he bosses me about you safety things. And then I've got a, uh, a German boss who is uh, uh, my uh, a German four-star, and he's commander of Allied Forces Central Europe. And as commander of Allied Air Forces Central Europe, I work for him. And I go to his meetings, and, we, and if we went to war, I would do what he told me to do. So we're already there. So I'm a little surprised uh, at, at, at the question that has come up in the newspapers. Now, uh, you have to add, though, uh, that's in a very structured command and control environment. And we have had a part of the selection of that German four-star uh, through the NATO process. And, uh, and he works for General Shalikashvili today as the Supreme Allied Commander of Europe. So there is a tightly integrated system. But it's a system that I have complete confidence in. And I, w I am ready to send my squadrons of F-16s down to Turkey if we'd gone to war in the old scenario, and they fought under a Turkish three-star out in one tactical air force, and, and he was their boss. And he was the guy that ran their war on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, so we, we do that all the time, but it's in a very structured command and control. So you don't want to just take and throw troops off to, in a willy-nilly way and say, okay, there's some guy, they're setting up, he's setting up office over in some place and you go work for him. We wouldn't do it that way. It, it, we need to have it in an organized and structured way where we have a, an input to the general thrust of the uh, actions involved. But, but command uh, under a foreign uh, leader is, is nothing foreign to us. I've the, the general question, I believe, is what are the, the types of reservations which NATO members have about making out-of-area commitments, the example given uh, uh, the Germans' uh, fear of loss of life outside of their area? I, um, uh, I'm very comfortable addressing that question. I do not think, I think it's wrong to characterize it as a German fear of putting German blood at risk. It is a it's in response to German history, and uh, Germans have reacted very strongly, as you would want them to, to their World War II uh, uh, experience and, uh, and conduct. And they have uh, limited their military, they've dramatically changed the concept of military, the role of the military in their society, as you would want it to. And, uh, and so they have constitutionally they thought, they would argue, have prohibited themselves from operating outside of the NATO area of responsibility. I had them come to, I had the top German officers, both air and land, come during the, the Gulf War and say, we are really embarrassed that we cannot go to the Gulf and fight with you. But the Ger it, it, I would have been terribly surprised if they had, because they were involved in unification at that time. So the Gulf War is not a meaningful data point in that discussion. They were, t it was like, we were fighting our revolutionary war and we didn't go fight some war off someplace else. It was that dramatic for them, their unification process. Uh, now, they are arguing, and, and if we had a German here, if, the, uh, the, if, the, if you ask the German ambassador, he would say, we're addressing that question and we're very optimistic that we're going to get a constitutional understanding that will prohibit or will permit us to operate uh, in a, in a full-scale way uh, as a, as a full-fledged member in the alliance. And if, you had a, if I had the Brit ambassador here or a, a senior Brit policy thinker uh, or other members, they would say they do not feel threatened. They do not feel that that's a problem, that the Germans are not doing it today. The Germans are pushing. Uh, they get reined back every once in a while by the, uh, by, it's a political discussion, uh, the out-of-area thing. And, uh, and most are eager to do it, and they just have to resolve the constitutional question like any democratic country does, discussion and then a vote. I think that three years from now you will find that they, are, they have solved that problem and they're involved in everything that we're doing. They are already involved in some areas that a year ago they wouldn't have. 
and they they brought it to vote uh, so that they are down in Bosnia Herzegovina in, in some ways that uh, they couldn't do it a year ago. <laughs> they even had a court finding that let them do it. Pardon him, he wasn't passing. <laughs> He, he flies F-16s, you say. <laughs> How do you assess the stability of Germany? <laughs> the, um, uh, I think the reason that NATO is so important uh, from a Russian point of view, the Russians want to talk to Western Europe. And they want to talk to a Western Europe. They don't want to talk to any individual country. Uh, I mean, they'll talk to them bilaterally, but they want someone to talk to that represents Western Europe because what does Western Europe have? Western Europe has all the money. Western Europe is their biggest hope for economic development by bringing in capital that they absolutely don't have. Western Europe has know-how, and uh, Western Europe has a vital interest in them. So they want to talk to Western Europe, and they want to talk to Western Europe organization that includes the United States, and that is only NATO. And uh, I think the Russians see that. So they want to have a meaningful conversation with Western Europe. And NATO is the best example. One of that Rome decree uh, elements was NATO will become more political. I don't think they had any idea how prophetic that was. NATO is dramatically more political today and serves a very important political contact role. Uh, so that's, that addresses the first question. Now, Germans, and I, the reason I don't think that uh, the Russians have great, German, they, the Germans have had that reaction we talked to earlier to their World War II experience in dramatic ways, and it's changed the way they do business in a lot of ways. And they go out of their way not to be militarily threatening. You look at what they're doing to their military, they're drawing it down dramatically. So in terms of, of military aggression, I don't think people spend a lot of time worrying about that. And as I said earlier, I think the neo-Nazi movement is an anti-refugee movement. And I've discussed it with Germans. It's not just what I think. I've discussed it with senior Germans. And their view is it is not a uh, neo-Nazi is entirely the wrong word uh, because it is an anti-refugee movement. They want to close their borders some. They don't want to bring in a million in 1994, a million more refugees. They ha because they do it in such a dramatic fashion. They provide them housing and money, and when they bring a refugee in, they provide them far better than we do. Uh, and that's not a state, I don't feel guilty about that. They just have a different concept. Part of that is in reaction to their history, their history of 50 years ago. So they bring refugees in, and they treat them very, very well. Uh, so it's a very expensive proposition. So I think neo-Nazi is an anti-refugee movement uh, and, and Germans are very embarrassed about it. It's a problem. I don't want to trivialize it, but it, uh, it is not, I, I don't think it's a, th a threat to fall back to their, to their past. I, I don't see that at all. And I don't think the German leadership sees it that way. Uh, English is the language of aviation around the world, except in Russia. And Russian pilots do not speak English. Uh, there are some others that uh, really Eastern European pilots did not, although they're learning it. Uh, Warsaw Pact pilots did not, but uh, certainly German pilots and, uh, and French pilots speak uh, uh, enough English that we can effectively conduct these kind of operations. Uh, that's true throughout the alliance. English is the dominant language of the alliance, with French as the backup language. General, for an extraordinarily informative evening and, and for your great generosity, we thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate the turnout tonight, and I appreciate your interest in the things that are most dear to me, and, uh, and I appreciate the quality of your questions. Uh, thank you so much for letting me be with you tonight. Thank you.